So I, I think it you know, should go without saying at a conference of this nature that, that um, the question of class politics and the question of the role of the working class is not a fetishization of the working class, but a recognition that the working class is, is the only class that is in a position to, to bring about true human liberation. And, um, and that is based on the relationship that the working class has to the means of production. Um, for Marxism, of course, human history is a history of class struggle. And capitalism, as the form of class society that we've arrived at today, um, has the central opposition between the bourgeoisie, which owns the means of production, and the working class, which actually creates all the profit under capitalism that the capitalists reap. Um, and, you know, I know that that's sort of a strange perspective sometimes for people in the U.S. today where the myth has existed for so long that everyone is middle class. Everyone from a file clerk to a doctor to a manager is, is considered all a part of the middle class in, in the way that things are presented on the news and on television. Um, and I think one thing that Occupy Wall Street um, brought back into public consciousness was the idea that there's a very small percentage of the population that actually has a tremendous amount of control in the society based on their ownership of the means of production. Um, and I think one of the reasons why a populist movement like that could come to that conclusion or see that today is because that we have corruption and bribery and sort of the naked contempt for the vast majority of the population that is on a display in a way that it hasn't been since the Gilded Age. Like, so to talk about, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, the Marxist movement posed these questions in a certain way. Um, the questions are all still the same, really. What's happened is that um, for a long time, there were various ways in which that question was sublimated in the mainstream discourse within the U.S. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a reason for that. Um, you know, relatively to many other countries uh, in the United States, there has been a relative lack of class consciousness, a lack of the working class um, seeing its historic role and seeing its relationship to the means of production. Uh, and, you know, a lot of writers have um, offered various explanations for that. I, I think that... Um, you know, some of the primary ones that we can touch on are the legacy of slavery and of racism in this country and the ability for employers to exploit divisions between black workers and white workers. Um, the super exploitation of uh, immigrants uh, as they came to this country and, again, the use of xenophobia to divide workers from each other on the assembly line. Uh, and, and then again, you, you know, you did have the fact that the assembly line and, and these terrible conditions of uh, oppression on the shop floor actually have also played the factor of bringing workers together who would not have talked to each other before through the trade unions, you know, and, and of, you know, so, so it's something that has cut both ways, certainly. Um, and then, you know, there has been a safety valve early in the U.S. history with westward expansion and a relative class mobility, perhaps, in comparison to Europe. Um, so industrial unionism in this country arrives relatively late, uh, but it makes significant inroads when it arrives, and arrives in a really explosive fashion uh, during the Great Depression. Not at the beginning of the Depression, but, you know, around 1934, you know, the working, uh, the, the labor movement has sort of been knocked to its knees by the Depression, and then as conditions get so bad that some sort of resistance is necessary. You have, you know, three significant strikes in 1934. And I think it's worth noting um, that all of them were led ostensibly by revolutionaries. Um, you had a waterfront strike in San Francisco that was led by the Stalinized uh, Communist Party. Uh, the Toledo Auto Light strike uh, that was led by the Mustiites, who would then merge into um, the Trotskyist movement in this country. And uh, the Minneapolis Teamster strike, which was led by the Trotskyists. And, and these three strikes really paved the way for the uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. Um, and the relatively short period of time in which there was a mass labor revolt uh, ends up by being tamed, uh, essentially by the politics of um, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration uh, in the early years of World War II. Um, it, 
ultimately with a certain complicity by both the Stalinists and the Social Democrats who were willing to subordinate the independence of working class struggle in the U.S. to the imperialist war drive for World War II um, through the things like the No Strike Pledge and um, compulsory union um, arbitration, uh, which the bureaucracy of the labor movement was willing to accept in exchange for uh, dues checkoff and union recognition. Um, there was opposition to this. Um, John Lewis, of course, famously opposed the No Strike Pledge. Uh, the Minneapolis Teamsters actually uh, were quite vocal in their opposition to it. And in July of 1941, FDR arrested um, 29 uh, prominent uh, Trotskyist leaders, many associated with the Teamsters Union in Minneapolis, uh, for their opposition to the No Strike Pledge under uh, the Smith Act laws. Um, and uh, we had relative quiescence until the end of World War II when there was a massive strike wave from 1945 to 1946 with almost 9 million workers striking. Um, Truman responded with sweeping strike-breaking legislation, including Taft-Hartley, and the legacy of Taft-Hartley is something that we're all living with today. Um, also in the immediate period after World War II um, came the Red Purge of the early McCarthy period with the removal of many seasoned militants from the union movement. Um, the only politics permitted at that point in the 1950s were essentially those of the bureaucracy. Uh, and I think that, that that really poses sort of what is the task in the labor movement today, and there's not much time to really talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, but I think that the most essential need is the fight to bring political consciousness back into the labor movement uh, as opposed to the contest between um, various factions within the bureaucracy of the labor movement and uh, a sort of lesser evilism that um, prevails even within the trade union movement. Um, that what needs to happen is the construction of programmatically based caucuses uh, within the trade union movements that are able to pose political issues beyond the simple bread and butter issues within trade unions today um, and take uh, the fight beyond uh, mere defensive posture to um, something that actually speaks to the need for the emancipation of the working class. Um, one of the things that our organization uses as a model for that within our very modest limitations is the transitional program which was the founding document of the Trotskyist Fourth International uh, in 1940. Um, the transitional program was conceived of by Trotsky as a way of bringing forward very immediate demands that could be raised within the unions and within the um, movements of social struggle that would at the same time pose the fundamental question of uh, capitalism and, and be a bridge to a revolutionary consciousness for workers. Um, one of the examples that um, I've really looked to is the work that was done in the International Longshore Workers Union in the 1970s and 1980s by the then revolutionary um, Spartacist League. Um, the program that, um, that the militant longshoremen had uh, was one of um, uh, six hours of a uh, shift, uh, eight hours pay. With, so with no pay cut, which reflected the transitional programs 30 for 40. Uh, the defense of the hiring hall, that is that the union would control the assignments and um, where workers would um, uh, work on uh, unloading ships. Um, the defending of the union conditions and safety through job actions uh, without reliance on the government. Um, defense of the union. Um, building labor solidarity, um, opposing uh, employer and government strike breaking, uh, including defying injunctions. Um, they raised anti-fascist demands, which were meant to also be a bridge to the largely black and Latino workforce in the union and, and to focus on the immediate demand, uh, demands and, and recognize the oppression that workers faced under capitalism. Um, the call for working class action uh, in uh, international, um, yeah, um, sorry, and the break with the Democratic and Republican parties. 
And the legacy of that, actually, even though the Caucasus have not existed as such, you know, for almost 20 years now, is that there have been many militants that went through that experience, had the experience of participating in 1984 hot car going actions against um, South African goods being brought um, into the U.S. And uh, there was a West Coast um, one day longshore strike against the uh, war in Iraq. There was also a um, one-day job action that shut down ports up and down the West Coast, demanding freedom from Umia Abu Jamal. And um, finally, just to wrap up, um, the other speakers already touched on it, but I think that you know one thing that we see, since in some ways we're in an analogous period with this recession, as where um, the strikers were in 1934 in the Great Depression, is that working conditions have been pushed back so much. Uh, people are working so many more hours for so much less money. Unemployment has lingered for so long that you're beginning to get fight back just from the fact that people cannot survive this way much longer, and you're getting it at the very bottom of the workforce with things like the fast food worker strike. So, you know, I think that, that if we had a un union movement that was not completely bureaucratized and, and corrupted at this point, uh, it would be putting a lot more energy into reaching out and organizing um, low-wage workers, and that that is a role that conscious Marxists should play within the trade union movement.